right now to, invent up, to invite up the doctor who actually, <clears throat> now correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Uh, Amalu, who actually discovered CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, in 2005 in the brain of a football player. Pardon me? Oh, excuse me. He discovered it in 2002. And the NFL did everything possible to discredit him. They had a doctor called Dr. Ira Kasson. We named him Dr. No. And his answer was, there's no scientific evidence that getting hit in the head causes brain damage. Well, Dr. No has left town. I don't know where he is, but he's gone. And so uh, I would like to invite up uh, Dr. Amalu, and he could uh, share with us a little bit as far as what getting hit in the head really does to you and, and, and what is CTE? But uh, if you pay attention to me, after a couple of minutes, you will start understanding what I'm saying. As you may have seen in the ESPN article, where they emphasized that I was a Nigerian, that I was a foreigner. So yes, I'm a Nigerian, I'm a foreigner. But the motive to do good knows no boundaries. It knows no race. It knows no religion. I have seven degrees and certifications. Um, six I got in the United States, one I got in Nigeria. And while I was on my fifth uh, program, my father called me, he's turning 90 years old this year, and said to me, Bennett, why are you getting all this education? What is it for? I said, well, I don't know. He said, no, no, don't tell me that I don't know. That no matter what you do, if the education you are acquiring is to serve your own self, to be narcissistic, then it, it shall be null and void. It's, it will be of no benefit. That if that is my motive, I should better stop and go get married and raise my kids. But he said, however, if you're raising your kid, if, if, sorry, if, if you're acquiring this education to make a difference in the lives of other people, that he would fully support me and go ahead, boy, get all the education you want. That you must aspire to use your God-given talent, the drive to go to school, to acquire knowledge, to help other people around you to enhance the lives of other people. Because not everybody has the talent to go to school, to acquire knowledge. And after I spoke with him on the phone, it took me quite a while to have a grasp, a mental grasp of what he was saying. And so it was in 2001 I was under training as a, a fellow in forensic pathology under Dr. Cyril Wett. And some lawyers came to him to help him out with a case of a man called Thomas Kimball who was sentenced to death for a quadruple homicide. Dr. Cyril Wett reviewed the case, a very big case, not so high profile because Thomas Kimball was some country man up in northern Pennsylvania. So he passed the case over to me. He said, Bennett, see what you can do to help these people out. And I took up the case. A man who had been sentenced to death, he was on death row. And I spent six months on the case. And out of over 10,000 documents, over 2,000 pictures, there was only one picture that showed the hands of a man with blood on it. 
And I picked up that picture and said, whose hands are this? Are these Thomas Kimball's hands? I said, no. It's the hands of the husband of the victim. To cut the whole story short, I testified on the case. Thomas Kimball was exonerated. The, the, the chief justices of the state of Pennsylvania dismissed the case. And Thomas Kimball was set free from death row. So that was my very first experience of using my knowledge to make a difference in the lives of others. And he's still alive today, Thomas Kimball. He was mildly mentally retarded. That was why he was vulnerable. So in 2002, it was on a Saturday morning, I was getting ready to go to work. And I saw on TV, ESPN, CNN, Michael Webster was dead. He was being beaten up, up upon on TV. That he was a loser in life. He sold his farthings. He was a vagabond. He lived up off his truck. But my knowledge said to me, no, that is not true. If he played football, I did not grow up in this country. I did not know anything about football. All I thought football was, was a group of people dressed up as extraterrestrials, with helmets, with helmets running around a field that hitting upon one another. But I wondered, why do they have to wear helmets? Does it mean there's a risk of brain injury? Well, why is the need for helmets? So I said to myself, in my room, in my small condo, I was a poor young doctor. If there is a need to wear helmets in football, and if in the game of football they impact their heads, in every play, players impact their heads, that there is a risk of permanent brain damage. This is very well established in science since the 18th century. And if this individual they are talking about played football for 17 years, there was no question in my mind that his brain was damaged. But I dismissed it because I didn't have his brain. I couldn't prove it. And I went to work. And I said, oh, damn, I wish I could get his brain. Lo and behold, I got to work and Mike Webster was on the autopsy table. And I remember what my father said to me. You must make a difference in the lives of other people. It's not about me. And I examined, and I said, if you read in the SPN magazine, they said I'm mystical. I'm not mystical. That is a very negative connotation. I'm a devout Catholic. Catholics believe that when you die, there's life after death. We pray for the dead, and we pray to the dead. Because we believe, even Christ said it. That when you pass on in this life, you're not dead. Your, your spirit leaves. That is not mysticism. And I said to the spirit of Mike Webster, Mike, I'm a nobody. You guys, wherever you are, should fight the battles for me. You should help me. You should guide me. I said that to Mike Webster. I said that to Terry Long. I said that to Justin Streisjack. I said that to Andrew Waters. I said that to Chris Benoit. There's no question in my mind. They are fighting the battles. I'm a nobody from Nigeria. I did not know what the NFL was. I was naive. But when Mike Webster's brain came back, it was positive for what I thought it was. I, luckily, again, like my father said to me, I had an MBA. Master's in Business Administration from Carnegie Mellon University, one of the top 10 business schools in the world. And so I knew business. I knew how to manage a brand. And I said to myself, Bennett, you cannot just publish this as another disease. It will be drowned. You need to give it a name. I need to give it a sexy name. You need to give it a name that has a good acronym that people would remember, even the three-year-old kid would remember. That was how CTE came about. Why CTE? If you review, I have evidence. 
life. I have published papers since the 18th century. People have been talking about reporting doctors that in any activity in life where you expose your head to repeated blows, no matter how seemingly innocuous those blows are, with time you will develop brain damage. And they had all types of names for them. And I, I would have shown you if the PowerPoint was up. Some of the names were compensation neuroses. Because at some point they thought those people pretended or faked to be sick. Some called it traumatic encephalitis. Some called it concussion neurosis. And some called it chronic traumatic brain injury. Some called it traumatic encephalopathy. So I sat, I sat in my bedroom one night in late 2002. I said, okay, look, there's a possibility that some smart doctor paid very well, more knowledgeable than I am, may disprove me. So I need to give myself a backup. So I needed a name that was generic. So if I'm boxed into a corner, I could wiggle my stuff out and say, oh, chronic means long term. Traumatic means trauma. Encephalopathy means bad brain. So chronic traumatic encephalopathy really means bad brain from trauma over time. Doesn't really mean anything. So I had to play both sides. You need to be smart in business. So now I divide a brand. That was my only motive. I lost money. I lost money. I lost over $250,000 of my own money. I couldn't buy a house because I was working on CT. I was paying for the analysis with my own hard earned money. So it hurts me psychologically and pains me emotionally to hear people calling me names that are not repeatable. Where were they when I was working on eight cases of CTE? And they use coded language. But while, while this was happening, I remained focused because that was a promise I made to Mike Webster and Terry Long and to Waters' mother that I'll, I'll say this to the end. I'll make a difference in their lives. I wept the day I met with Andrew Waters' mother in West Palm Beach. I paid. I flew down with my own money. And I wept. So while all the noise was going around, I was thinking in business, there are steps to a successful business. Now that I have identified this disease, I have a name for it. Where do we go from here? I said to myself, I ignored all the noise. I need to establish what the pathology is. First steps. After I've established the pathology, based on what we already knew in science, I needed a way to identify it in the living patient. And then the next would be treatment. And I said it before the Congress. I said it in, during the congressional hearing. That is a business concept, the ongoing concern concept. You need to remain positive. And you need to believe inside you that your business will succeed. I believe CTE will succeed. So it was about two years ago, in my research, quietly, I, sp I spent my own money, because if I had relied on other people, they would have torn me apart. They would have been crushed me. But what my father told me, make a difference in the lives of other people. So I was researching, reading, reading, and I came across a compound that was discovered 20 years ago. Well, not about, about 15 years ago by a group of doctors. They were working on Alzheimer's disease. So based on what I knew about CTE, this was very quiet. I discovered CTE in football players in 2002. Nobody heard, out, heard about it until 2005. And there was a reason why you heard about it in 2005. So I spoke to another doctor, and we approached the group 
at UCLA. That this compound you have, it, nobody has really thought about it, nobody. And I would think we can use it to identify CTE in living patients. Because once you cannot identify it in living patients, you know who has it. That we can start testing for treatment. They said, oh, we need to raise $100,000. Need to give them $100,000 to run it on five players. They almost dismissed it. I mean, they were like, oh, oh you're Dr. Malo. Oh, no, we've heard, we, we've heard about you. You should not be trusted. You're not credible. Anybody who says I'm not credible is indirectly saying that CTE is not a disease. So we went on, took over, and I approached some of your wives, some of the players. We identified about 15 players. You were, some of you were so kind, especially the wives. And they went. At about the fifth player, the $100,000 was expended. But the outcome was productive. The paper was published this year. And yet some people dismissed it. Oh, they dismissed it. That it should not be accepted. Where were you when CTE was identified? And where were you when we are identifying it in the living? Oh, he's not repeatable. But again, my focus is not to get to become personally aggrandized. My target is one day I'll look back and I'll say to Mike Webster, oh yes, we made it. We made it. So now we'll be moving forward to identify CTE in more living patients very soon. And my target is still treatment. And not the treatment that will treat symptoms. It is the treatment that will address the underlying pathology. Not treatment for symptoms. Depression is a symptom of CTE. Do you want to treat only depression? What about is like treating if you have pneumonia with fever. You treat the fever and do not treat the pneumonia. But for you, that is where my business school education comes in. For you to develop problems or solutions for complex problems, you need to think outside the box. Look at Boeing. Boeing is a very good example. Boeing was not doing so well. What did they do? They went and bought a CEO that knew nothing about building planes. He knew nothing about building planes. He was outside the mainstream. That is what we need to do for CT. You need to be bold and you need to think outside the box. You need to stay away from the mainstream. And in fact, one of my strongest points or strongest attributes is that I was not part of the mainstream. So I was not thinking like mainstream. You need to be aggressively innovative. And before I sit down, so I would close on a positive note. But before I sit down, you see the NFL. The NFL is a corporation, it's a business. It's a business. I mean, nobody would deny it. It's a business. And the fundamental objective of a business is what? The bottom line, money. It's money, so I'm not surprised. And a player to the NFL, if you see the, the accounting sheet, the balance sheet of a company, you have liabilities and you have equity. A player is expendable. It's an expendable, expendable, it may not even be equity. It may be a liability. This is the business side of it. 
And because of my MB, MBI now, I'm not upset with the NFL, I'm not mad or angry at them, because it's a business. And in a business, you need to do what you've got to do to protect your bottom line. They are not evil people, it's business. And as long as they keep on having a steady supply of the expendable liability, you manage the business. It's about the mission, not about the man. But as long as God gives me life, I'll use my knowledge to make a difference as much as I could as an individual in the lives of the people I encounter, including you guys. Thank you. TAU. Now, the tau protein is a protein that exists normally in the human cell, not just the brain. In the brain cell, it's part of the skeleton, the skeleton, the microscopic skeleton of the brain cell. The brain cells have skeleton, just like we have skeleton. So it's associated with the skeleton of the brain cell. Now, I wanted to show you if this was working. Yeah. After every game of football, there's a protein that accumulates in your brain. We call amyloid precursor protein after, after every game of football. And when that protein accumulates over and over and over, it begins to instigate abnormal responses of the biochemical systems of the cells. Some enzymes become activated. And over time, they will begin to form abnormal tau, which will accumulate in your brain cells, impair the normal functioning of the brain cells, and eventually kill the brain cells. And not just only tau, there are other abnormal proteins that accumulate your brain goes into a chronic state of inflammation. And that was why I said we should rather look at the root cause rather than treating the symptoms. There are actually drugs. Remember I said innovative thinking. We need to be innovative. We need to be aggressively innovative and bold and not be any respect of anybody. And like I have said, even an insignificant foreigner like me has something to contribute. And so tau protein we use as a marker, but the mistake we have made or that has been made in the public domain, you all hear tau, tau, tau. Tau is not the only abnormality in the brains of CTE sufferers. There are other proteins and there are other events going on in the brains of CTE sufferers. Did I explain that well? Dr. Malu, if you want. You know. uh, to go through it yeah. again? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, just a quick overview. Huh? Sorry. Okay. Do we have. Uh... Okay, what about a point? Okay, go back to the first one. Sorry. I'll be quick. Okay, next one. Next one. Next one. I'll just go through. Okay, when you hear of CTE, there's actually another disease of the brain called chronic toxic encephalopathy. This is seen in people who work in chemical industries who are exposed to solvents. Again, chronic exposure to types mm. of solvents or um, biochemical solutions can also cause brain damage. So CTE is not only for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. We need to be aware of that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So CTE, sorry, is not the only trauma. Um, is not the only encephalopathy we have. Next. Well, this is the definition 
You can have CTE from just one single episode of severe traumatic brain injury. It's not only in football players. That is why when I hear some people denying CTE, I almost get crazy. This is very well established in the literature. Even Hippocrates referred to brain damage, the madness that follows brain trauma. Okay? You can develop CTE from repeated episodes of brain trauma, like somebody who falls off a bicycle, maybe fell off a bicycle three times as a teenager, was involved in a car accident once, can also develop CTE. Then if you are in a career or you are part of a group that are chronically exposed to repeated blows to the head, the military, repeated acceleration, deceleration of the brain, the so-called post-traumatic stress disorder, actually may belong to CTE spectrum in the military. If you are a child, you're playing football, you may not have symptoms. That is the dangerous part of it. You may not know your brain is being damaged. You don't have symptoms. You can develop CTE even with no documentation of any brain injury. And this is very well established in the scientific literature. Now, let me give you, let me say something. I'm not smarter than the American doctors. I'm not smarter than them. They had better opportunities. Why will it take a Nigerian like me to come to America and identify a disease in the most popular spot in the United States of America? There is something wrong with that picture. I've asked myself, because when I started doing this, I wasn't aware of what I was doing. I was just intellectually curious. I was playing. This was my hobby, examining brains. As silly as it may sound, I had brains in my house. Saturday night, I would bring brains and examine, examine on the microscope. So next, next, next. Okay, another thing we need to remember, because people don't talk about it, is PTE, post-traumatic encephalopathy. The commonest symptom following brain trauma is what? Seizure disorder. The difference between PTE and CTE, in PTE, there is structural destruction of the brain. There's death of brain tissue locally, like you would have in a stroke. And it is commoner in boxers. Boxers, because there is more focalized punching, will have typically a combination of PTE and CTE. But because football players wear helmet, they don't have PTE because the helmet gives you a sense of false protection. And that is why CTE, because there's no local damage of tissue on conventional CT scan, will be negative. Conventional MRI will be negative. And one of, this was one of the, reason, one of the uh, uh, reasons the NFL doctor said I was a fraudulent doctor. But when they said that, I laughed in my bedroom that they were the ignorant, either by fault or default, the ignorant doctors. And it was so shameful that doctors of the NFL were that ignorant. <laughs> Especially for a Nigerian like me who looks up to America to be the top and best in the world. It was an embarrassment to me. It was a scandal, in my, in my opinion. So what they thought was CTE was actually PTE. Am I making sense? Next. Okay, next. These are just, aha. Uh -huh. This is the brain of a boxer, the one on the left side, with a combination of PTE and CTE. This was a boxer who was, who was punched, fell on the, on the canvas. The doctors on the uh, ring side did not recognize it. He suffered a subdural hemorrhage. And the right side of his brain died. Mm. 
So when he died, his brain was sent to me. He had a combination of PTE and CTE. That is the brain of Mike Webster, the mm. very first case of CTE. You see, it looks normal. It looks very normal. This is another attack you will hear when they are trying to ridicule me that I show pictures of brains. If I don't show you pictures of brains, what else will I show you? Pictures of football players with helmets running around a field? That is not my expertise. This is my expertise. So they are trying to throw every dirt they have at me to ridicule me. But that is a business technique. That is actually a very solid business tactic. Because that is called brand perception. <laughs> people who don't know me, most people don't know who I am. They keep on hearing negative things about me. Subconsciously, they will start perceiving me as somebody negative that should not be trusted. That is a brand management technique. So I know what they are doing. You are what you are perceived to be. So it's a technique. I'm not angry because I know it's all business. They're managing their brand well, and I respect that. Next. Okay, these are the names they've had for CTE since the 18th century. Cerebral neurasthenia, compensation hysteria, concussion neurosis, delayed traumatic apoplexy, Dementia pugilistic, it was actually a naval officer, a naval lieutenant of the United States Navy that came up with the name Dementia Pugilistica in 1937. Because he thought it was a, a sexier name than Punch Drunk that Dr. Matlan gave it in 1928. Dr. Matlan was a medical examiner like me in Newark, New Jersey in 1928. Post-traumatic stress disorder, and guess what? The way I'm being treated today was the way Matland was treated by the Boxing Association, who denied that there was nothing like dementia pugilistic, and actually paid their own doctors to ridicule dementia pugilistic. But we know better today, right? Punch drunk, terror neurosis, traumatic constitution, traumatic encephalitis, traumatic encephalopathy of boxers, traumatic hysterias. Next. This is the CTE Hall of Fame. This was the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the eighth case. The first um, seven cases I had. Okay, uh, yeah, that's Justin Strach. Like, there's a, an eighth one missing. Wrestling. Again, if you go, if you Google my name, WWE lawyers have put out all types of things out there about me. Again, brand management, perception. Next. Uh -huh. I, I wanted to emphasize this. You would hear in the news that concussions cause CTE. Is that true or false? That is false. Concussions don't cause CTE. What causes CTE? Repeated blows to the head. Concussion is a manifestation of repeated blows to the head. Blunt force trauma is the cause of CTE. Concussion belongs to the CTE spectrum. It is not what causes CTE, but guess what? Brand management. Concussions are less inflammatory, are less damaging than CTE. Concussion is about the patient. It's not about the play. It's not about the game. Repeated blows to the head is about the game. So brand management, make it concussions and blame the players that they are not reporting concussions. Concussions don't cause CTE. Repeated blows to the head with or without a helmet. And you may have not heard of the concept of sub-concussions. After every game of football you play, you suffer microscopic injury of your brain that wouldn't manifest symptomatically. This was proven by medical examiners in New York City in the 1920s. <laughs> and there are pictures. They have microscopic hemorrhages that they call concussional hemorrhages. So please, whenever you're talking about CTE, concussions don't cause CTE. Blunt force trauma to the head causes CTE. And another fallacy is helmets do not prevent Concussions or subconcussions of the brain. 
A helmet cannot stop you from suffering acceleration, deceleration of your brain. Because the helmet does not hold your brain. That is a fallacy. Where it came from, I don't know. Next. So I wanted to show you this wonderful. You see, after the game of football, that's the normal brain on your left, upper left side. Hours after a game of football where you've hit your head repeatedly, the APP accumulates. Why have we seen this? Because we've been, you know, I, I cut up dead people for a living. My daughter will laugh at me or daddy cuts up dead people. Hmm. But that's what I do to make a living. Somebody has to do it. We've been opportune sometimes. People after playing a game of football, and maybe they are going home and they're involved in a motor vehicle accident. And I grab their brain. They played football about uh, three hours prior. APP accumulates only after about two to three hours of the injury. So if they died suddenly, it was not the motor vehicle accident that caused the APP buildup. And their brain's APP will all light up. And APP stays like that for about three months before it disappears. That was another question I had. What was the scientific basis for the two-week return to play guideline? After a major concussion, at two weeks, your brain hasn't healed. Your brain is still highly inflamed. I was dismissed that I was, I should not be trusted. I'm not repeatable. This is CTE, and then in between, you have other changes. Next. Uh, symptoms of CTE were published as far back as 1927 by doctors. This Dr. Osnato Angilibati worked at the New York University Hospital. And then the symptoms they listed next are very, very similar to the symptoms I detected by interviewing Mike Webster's family, Terry Long's wife, um, and the water's mother. So this is not uh, an imagination of Dr. Malu. Next. The paranoid ideation, criminal, these are the papers I've published, you could find them. They are very well documented. Next. Next. Oh, these are the brains. Okay, next. It's not going to just keep, keep on. I wanted to show you some of the brains, but the system is not good. Next. Okay. You see how normal, this is a normal appearing brain. This was Mike Webster's brain. In fact, people have asked me, why did you cut this brain? When you knew it was normal, what made you cut it? Because I was angry. And I was. I thought Mike had let me down. I opened up his brain, his skull, his brain looked normal. I scratched my head, I'm like, gee. I got angry. And so I, I had to give myself some time to absorb the disappointment. So rather than cutting it and putting it back in the body, I saved it in a chemical. And I came back to it two weeks later after I had calmed and was more objective. So next. And on CT scan, this will look normal. Conventional CT scan, even doctors from Cleveland clinics said, oh, this brain looked normal. That, uh, uh, this, this guy is talking nonsense. It's not nonsense, it's science. Next. Next. So his brain looked very normal, does not look like Alzheimer's disease. Next. Next, next, next. Uh, his cerebellum looked normal, so it tells you it's not um, dementia pugilistica. Next. Next. Okay, okay, but back, back. Please note, CTE is not Alzheimer's disease. CTE is not Lou Gehrig's disease. CTE is not Parkinson's disease. CTE is CTE. When CTE involves the spinal cord, it is still CTE, but you modify it to say uh, uh, myeloencephalopathy to indicate that it's affecting both the spinal cord and the brain. It is not a new disease. So know that CTE by itself is CTE, and CTE is not PTE. Because again, in business, perception. If you muddy, if you muddy the brand recognition, Assuming Mercedes Benz, now that is why McDonald's. Anybody that has any company and names it McDonald's, McDonald's will come after you. 
or Mickey Mouse. Try it. There are not many things. Mickey Mouse. They will come after you. Why? Because they don't want their brand equity to be modded. It takes away from the brand recognition. So in CTE, if you start confusing people, CTE is Lugaric's disease. We don't know really what CTE is about. That is brand management. They are trying to mod it and confuse people. So people are like, oh, after what? I, I don't know what this is. So people will stop recalling it. We'll take away from the equity and we'll stop recognizing it. These are very smart business people and they are not doing anything evil. This is business. Next. 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 Uh -huh. This is just to show the APP. See how badly accumulated it is. The normal brain should be all blue. In fact, this was the brain of a football player. Following trauma. Next. Now, this is just the top. Just continue. Let me now get to the FDDNP. The FDDNP. Just continue, continue. Is it a big one? Okay, just, just continue. This is just the tau killing the brain cells. Uh, brain cells are dying. Just continue. The tau is the brown. Yes, that's the brown ones, yeah. Killing some of the next. But, but, but I wanted to show you the FDDNP, the five uh, NFL players we've done. And uh, believe me, trust me, we're moving forward. It will be available to everybody, hopefully by God's grace, very soon. And um, the cost, you know, we, we can always work out something with the association. But the, but the, most, the next step is, how do you identify this disease in the living people? And how do you quantify it? Who has mild, moderate, and severe? We don't have to wait for them to die. Because what we have now is just very subjective, the neuropsychiatric testing, which is, in my opinion, it has its limitations. I think it has been over, over promoted. Okay, it's, uh, there's a significant amount of subjectivity. We need more objective evidence. Next. Oh, okay, you know what, can you stay here? Can I stay two more minutes? Is that okay? Perfect, as long as you like. This is the part of the brain we call the locus serialis. Locus serialis, let, let me, for you to be a normal human being, mentally, the hormones in your brain have a variation. We call it the homeostasis, technical jargon. A very delicate balance of neurotransmitters, just like in the hormones of a woman, the reproductive cycle, there's a very delicate balance of the hormonal levels. Whenever you have a disruption of that balance, you will start manifesting behavioral impairment. Like reacting over aggressively to very subtle irritation. Your locus cerulis is one of the centers in your brain that synthesizes no adrenaline. No adrenaline is what make, gives you your drive. And then it synthesizes, it supplies it to the rest of the brain. The tau goes and knocks it out. It's killing brain cells impairs the synthesis of no adrenaline. So the first thing that happens, like the family said, is they start having very, like, mood. In fact, one of the wives said he is, it was like he was bipolar. Variations in moods, fluctuations. Now he's suddenly happy. Next time he's crying. And as time goes on, as the cells die, from the Impaired variation, you now start having low levels of these hormones. That is why the very first thing Terry Long's wife said to me, he took all the antidepressants in the world, yet every time he's depressed. Why? The, com the fastest selling antidepressant, the last time I checked, was Prozac. What does Prozac do? It increases, it makes the cells in the dosal raffin nucleus, which synthesizes serotonin, to synthesize more serotonin and to increase the levels of serotonin in the synapses. Now, if the dosal nucleus is knocked out by tau, 
There's no amount of Prozac you give the individual. You don't have serotonin anymore. So what you have to do if you want to treat CTE, go and stop the cells from dying. Knock out the towel. And I'll show you something. Next. Knock out the towel. Next. Next. Okay. Before I get to that. This was the paper that was published. Dr. Small and Dr. George Barrier discovered this product, FDDNP, about 15, 20 years ago. And all we did was, hey, can we take this product and use it? Let's see if we can identify CTE in living people. Because in the market, this is the only product that binds to tar. The other ligands, Pittsburgh compound B and amivate, bind to amyloid. CTE is not a primary amyloid dopamine, although as you get older, it begins to resemble Alzheimer's disease. But when you're much younger, it's essentially a primary taropathy. So we need a ligand that binds to tar and not amyloid. But what will happen, the competitors are dismissing it because it's all about brand management and equity. It's about market share. The short form of it is FDDNP. I'm doing everything within my means as an individual to make this available as soon as possible. And thanks to my father and thanks be to God. I went to business school. I remember people were asking me, why are you going to business school? You're torturing yourself. But today, I'm very proud I did that. Because like now, I knew what to do to get this, to protect this, and get it out to the players as soon as possible. Because it's about intellectual equity. If I know what you know, Bill Gates said it. And if I even know it better than you, I'm more powerful than you in this knowledge-based economy. Global economy has changed. It's all about your access to information. So if I know more than you do, I'm more powerful than you because I can apply my knowledge. And so hopefully we'll make this available as soon as possible, enough of the waiting and the delaying. Next. And these are the pictures. You could see the normal brain this is just use the color changes. This is very simplified. Look at the normal brain on the left upper side and look at the CTE brains. You don't need to be a, a neuroradiologist to see that Houston, we've got a problem. Am I making sense? Yes, please. I'm one of those five. Wonderful. I'm in NFL 2 up in the upper right hand corner. Thank you so much. Okay. Remember what I had said earlier, I know the test like neuropsychiatric testing, right? Uh -huh. Those are subjective tests that have very broad overlapping sensitivity specificity. And what we have found, this is not just CTE. Two human beings may have the same viral load for HIV. One is extremely sick, one is not. Am I making sense? So, I'm sorry, I understand. manifestation of disease is not absolute because we're humans. So there's a broad variation. Medicine is not an absolute science, although we make an attempt to make it absolute. Am I making sense? So you could have presence of disease on the cellular level with minimal or uh, incubating symptomatology. Am I making sense? Yeah, I uh, see, see, you see, remember, it's unfortunate the field that I'm in. It is very unfortunate I'm a bearer of bad news. But the quantification of disease on the cellular level is not the same with the quantification of disease on the symptom level. Am I making sense? Okay. Some people with diabetes, if they die, you look at their pancreas. We have very, very bad pancreases. 
But you ask, did they have diabetes? No, they did not have diabetes. Am I making sense? Uh -huh. so, so it's not absolute. However, this is an indisputable objective evidence. Am I making sense? Now, there was a very brilliant doctor, Sir Simmons, in England in 1962, who said, we have more brain cells than we need, which is true. And when you have a disease of the brain, some of us have better reserve than other people. It may take longer to manifest in others. It may take shorter. And it may not even manifest symptomatically in some people. Uh, am I making sense? No, 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 no. Uh, the tau is not CTE. That's another mistake people make. Tau does not define okay. uh -huh. CTE. CTE. Yes. It's the, the repeated blows of the head. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. In fact, there was a very good paper published by uh, Dr. from Indiana. He, his name starts with a T. And some other papers. You don't need to have an acute manifestation of symptoms to have brain injury. Meaning, you don't need to have a concussion to have brain injury. As long as, and the injury is not, you don't even need impact. As long as there is acceleration, deceleration of your brain inside, and sudden changes in motion, the, especially the angular, the sudden changes in motion, the angular acceleration, deceleration. Am I making sense? Let me ask you a question. When did you start playing football? 75. How old were you? Uh, 27. What level were you in? NFL. College. No, NFL. You started playing football in the NFL? I started. When did you start playing football, amateur, professional? 1970. How old were you? I was 22, 23. 22. You played football in high school? Yeah. You played football in college? You played football in grade school. Okay. CTE is a cumulative outcome of your history of exposure to repeated acceleration and deceleration. I have said it before that I've not seen a retired NFL player who doesn't have CTE. In fact, last year, the American, Medical Asso the American Pediatric Association and the Canadian Pediatric Association came out with a position paper that children should not be allowed to engage in sports like boxing. Yes, yes. So the, thank you. There's a spectrum. Sorry? Thank you. Uh, the, every disease, in terms of disease manifestation, diseases are multifactorial. Remember when the human genome was expressed in 2000, we thought we would have a gene for every disease. But we have been disappointed. We found out that most diseases are multifactorial and polygenic. Okay? Now, what I always tell people is, it's unfortunate. If we, if, if we can clone you, okay? and have another, what's your first name, sorry, sir? Wayne. Wayne, and have another Wayne as a child. Again, I'm a bearer of bad news, pardon me. And have that Wayne not exposed to football. 
You could have been a Bill Gates. But assuming your exposure to football decompensated your intellectual reserve, there is no way we could know that. Am I making sense? I've seen, I'll give you a real life example, I wouldn't mention names. A young college kid came to me. That before he graduated, when he was in high school, he was a very brilliant kid. But he went to Vanderbilt. He wanted to learn classical music, but he played football in high school and through college. Unfortunately, it was only in his final year that a neurosurgeon at the University of um, Pennsylvania Hospital told him to stop playing. Then he wanted to go into graduate school to continue his classical music. He just could not. That is like he's no longer intelligent. And on one-on-one -on -one basis, what I said to him was what I've just told you. That because we're humans, we can't experiment with ourselves. We can't clone ourselves. That you've engaged in an activity that is very well known to cause cognitive decompensation. You were such a smart kid that suddenly even you yourself is noticing that you're no longer... And I said to him, because I had no proof to show him on... FDD and pure anything. I told him, do not exculpate or exclude your exposure to repeated impacts. Because all these discussions, nobody ever discussed these things. Not everybody kept quiet. Mm -hmm. Even football players refused to admit that they were having problems. It was only very recently that we are now more open with this. Because you guys are very a very proud bunch of people, you're strong. That, that culture of masochismo. It was just very recently that people started admitting, you know what, I'm having problems. And so rather than being in a state of denial, let's embrace it. It's only when we embrace it gladly that we will be, begin to come up with constructive, constructive opinions on how we can work together to make this better. Am I making sense? Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, in fact, I have a meeting on Monday morning with a woman who developed MS after a motor vehicle crash. She's from Dallas. And if you read the literature, MS has been insinuated to be in part aggravated or induced by traumatic brain injury. Because brain trauma is axonal injury. MS is an axonal disease, myelin. And in CTE cases, they lose myelin. So again, it may need some bold, young scientist to be bold and not be a respecter of persons and look further into it. One disadvantage of medical research, I must tell you, is this peer review process. If I submit an idea, it will be reviewed by older, more experienced, in quotes, doctors who are not open to new ideas. So they are less likely to accept your bold new idea as something viable, and they wouldn't finance it, as opposed to engineering. In fact, I was talking to a friend of mine who is a chemical, petrochemical engineer. Engineers want new ideas. Let's test it. So it's very well established that the peer review process of medicine dampens creativity. Okay, it is not definitive, but it's been associated 
brain trauma has been associated with MS yet. Uh -huh. So the next question comes, remember what I said is associated. Like, let me give you a good example. Coronary artery disease, okay? We don't know what causes it. And it runs in families. But we know if you smoke, it increases your risk of developing coronary artery disease. Not that smoking causes it, but we know it increases your risk. So the same concept applies to almost every disease. Am I making sense? How do we treat? How do we treat? Okay, can you show the next picture? No, no, the next, there's a next picture. Okay. Currently, there is no FDA-approved definitive way of curing CTE. And I must make a confession to you. Because the brain does not have the ability, reasonable ability to regenerate itself. If somebody takes out half of your liver and you die two years later, your liver will regrow. The brain doesn't have that ability. So brain diseases have always remained a challenge, including CTE. But again, let's be positive. If you're negative, that would, may not have accomplish anything in life. Since we have identified the pathology, can we keep on research to see if we could at least stop the, because this is all about proteins. And I was giving a lecture, I'll tell you this story, at the University of California, San Francisco. And I, well, we're talking about the science, this was very scientific. And one young doctor raised his hand, said to me, Ben, you know, this suicide they have, it's, it reminds me of bipolar disorder. They have this drive to commit suicide. And he said, you know what we use for such cases of bipolar? It's lithium. Now, have you thought about it? I said, gee, I'm a forensic person. I'm not a clinician. Why don't you think about it? So I got home. I didn't sleep. Because when I get very excited, I don't sleep. I was reading lithium. I was researching on it. And guess what? You know what lithium does? Lithium acts on the enzyme, the GSK3 enzyme, and prevents, this is the enzyme that causes the abnormal formation of tar. So what lithium does is that it prevents the step for the formation of tar. See how creativity comes with this was just somebody that made a comment. And it's in the literature that this is what lithium does. So nobody has really translated it and applied it. And again, this is where the creativity comes. Is it possible? Although lithium is a very dangerous drug. But the next thing is, can we get derivatives of lithium? Like we have derivatives of heroin, opium, oxycodone. Morphine, there are derivatives of opium and heroin. Can we get derivatives of lithium that can cross the blood-brain barrier and see if they can prevent the formation of tar? Uh, so I strongly believe that as we go further down the road, we could develop pharmacological agents. This is a belief, a strong belief I hold on to. Only if we stop the denial Recognize it for what it is and face it head on. Yes, please. Okay, you know, the, the smartest doctor is the doctor who knows his limitations. I'm not a clinician. I don't treat patients. So this is a question that is better suited for 
a therapist, a clinician. But, 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 what I always tell people is look for a doctor who is experienced in treating long-term effects of brain injury. Sorry? Okay. You take what? Oh, yoga, okay. Thank you. Good. Good. Which is very positive. Um, if you believe you can climb a mountain, you'll climb a mountain. I'm a Christian. Um, my Christian beliefs, some will call it being mystical. But I believe. I believe there is God. I believe God is powerful. The power of positive thinking. I, 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 I'll answer that question. I'm not a policy maker. That's a great question. I'm not a policy maker. Okay? I'm not. And I wouldn't make recommendations to the NFL or anybody about policies on playing or not playing football. However, two things. Individuals need to have what we call in medicine informed consent. When you're going to play, you should be fully made aware of the consequences, short and long term, of playing. So you make that personal decision for yourself. Mm -hmm. This is the land of the free. You make uh, your free, you have the liberty to make that decision, but you must be informed and adequately educated about the consequences. Now, I would adopt the Barack Obama strategy. 
Barack Obama said, knowing what we know now, he will have a second thought about letting his son, if he had one, to play football. I have a son. Knowing what I know now, I would not let my son, and if any coach or teacher in school talks to him to play, I'll sue him. Hmm. I'll not let my son play any high impact contact sport. It's my liberty. Mm -hmm. And high impact contact sport includes football, ice hockey, um, wrestling. Soccer is different, and I will explain why. I'll explain. I'll explain later. Um, I may let him play soccer, but any um, wrestling, what else? Boxing. I wouldn't let my son. Soccer, I would let him. Why? Impact to the head is not intrinsic to the play of soccer. Head injury, except heading, which I think they should take away from soccer. Hitting your head in soccer is not intrinsic to the play. You don't need it for the play. In fact, any contact to the head in soccer is a foul. However, like in every other activity in life, there is incidental exposure to head injury in soccer, like in basketball. I remember the key word I used, high impact contact sports. Now, when you read the literature, younger women who play soccer are women, younger women are more likely to have higher incidences of injury. This is just my personal scientific opinion. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Yes. So my answer to you is I would not let my son play, especially after I read the article by the American Pediatrics Association. I got angry. Why now? Why did they wait so long? Did I answer yet? Yes, please. I have to get down here. No, no, take your time. If I get into trouble. <laughs> involves millions of dollars. So this is something like I said, I'm just one voice. It has to take, it has to be industry driven. It has to be industry driven. It's, it's all part of the pragmatism of life. Um, but I, I remember positive. Yes. 10 years ago, before people knew it, it was much, much more difficult. Now, you don't talk about CTE. Uh -huh, but look at where we are today. So I remember positive. Yeah, yeah, we are, we are hopeful, but you know, like I said, I, in, in the court of law, I'm only an expert within a field. Um, I'm not a jack of all trade. Uh, I, have, I have an area and I limit myself humbly to my area. Okay? All right, thank you. So, oh, okay, last one. <laughs> Based on this point about the testing of the damage in this lawsuit, down the rate of damage or to arrest it. Am I making sense? Uh -huh. So you continue doing what you could do to help yourself. If you need the test for the lawsuit, it will still show evidence of damage. Okay. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you so Wait. much. Thank you. It was on a Saturday morning, I was getting ready to go to work, and I saw on TV, ESPN, CNN, Michael Webster was dead. He was being beaten up, up upon on TV, that he was a loser in life. He sold his father he was a vagabond. He lived up off his truck. 
But my knowledge said to me, no, that is not true. If he played football, I did not grow up in this country. I did not know anything about football. All I thought football was, was a group of people dressed up as extraterrestrials, <laughs> helmets, with helmets running around a field and hitting upon one another. But I wondered, why do they have to wear helmets? Does it mean there's a risk of brain injury? Well, why is the need for helmets? So I said to myself, in my room, in my small condo, I was a poor young doctor. If there is a need to wear helmets in football, and if in the game of football they impact your heads, in every play, players impact your heads, that there is a risk of permanent brain damage. This is very well established in science since the 18th century. And if this individual they are talking about played football for 17 years, there was no question in my mind that his brain was damaged. But I dismissed it because I didn't have his brain. I couldn't prove it. And I went to work. And I said, oh, damn, I wish I could get his brain. Lo and behold, I got to work and Mike Webster was on the autopsy table. And I remember what my father said to me. You must make a difference in the lives of other people. It's not about me. And I examined, and I said, if you read in the SPN magazine, they said I'm mystical. I'm not mystical. That is a very negative connotation. I'm a devout Catholic. Catholics believe that when you die, there's life after death. We pray for the dead and we pray to the dead. Because we believe, even Christ said it, that when you pass on in this life, you're not dead, you're, your spirit leaves. That is not mysticism. And I said to the spirit of Mike Webster, Mike, I'm a nobody. You guys, wherever you are, should fight the battles for me, should help me, should guide me. I said that to Mike Webster. I said that to Terry Long. I said that to Justin Streisjack. I said that to a brand. That was my only motive. I lost money. I lost money. I lost over $250,000 of my own money. I couldn't buy a house because I was working on CTE. I was paying for the analysis with my own hard earned money. So it hurts me psychologically and pains me emotionally. To hear people calling me names that are not repeatable. Where were they when I was working on eight cases of CTE? And they used coded language. But while, while this was happening, I remained focused because that was a promise I made to Mike Webster and Terry Long and to Waters' mother that I'll, I'll say this to the end, I'll make a difference in their lives. I wept the day I met with Andrew Waters' mother in West Palm Beach. I paid, I flew down with my own money. And I wept. So while all the noise was going around, I was thinking in business, there are steps to a successful business. Now that I have identified this disease, I have a name for it. Where do we go from here? I said to myself, I ignored all the noise. I need to establish what the pathology is. Three steps. After I've established the pathology, based on what we already knew in science, I needed a way to identify it in the living patient. And then the next would be treatment. And I said it before the Congress. I said it in, during the Congressional hearing. That is a business concept, the ongoing concern concept. You need to remain positive. And you need to believe inside you that your business will succeed. I believe CTE will succeed. So it was about two years ago, in my research, quietly, I spent my own money, because if I had relied on other people, they would have torn me apart. They would have crushed me. But what my father told me, make a difference 
in the lives of other people. So I was researching, reading, reading, and I came across a compound that was discovered 20 years ago. Well, not about, about 15 years ago by a group of doctors. They were working on Alzheimer's disease. So based on what I knew about CTE, this was very quiet. Right now, to invent up, to invite up the doctor who actually, <clears throat> now correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Uh, Amalu, who actually discovered CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, in 2005 in the brain of a football player. Pardon me? Oh, excuse me. He discovered it in 2002. And the NFL did everything possible to discredit him. They had a doctor called Dr. Ira Kasson. We named him Dr. No. And his answer was, there's no scientific evidence that getting hit in the head causes brain damage. Well, Dr. No has left town. I don't know where he is, but he's gone. And so uh, I would like to invite up uh, Dr. Amalu, and he could uh, share with us a little bit as far as what getting hit in the head really does to you, and, and, and what is CTE? But uh, if you pay attention to me, after a couple of minutes, you will start understanding what I'm saying. As you may have seen in the ESPN article, where they emphasized that I was a Nigerian, that I was a foreigner. So yes, I'm a Nigerian, I'm a foreigner. But the motive to do good knows no boundaries. It knows no race. It knows no religion. I have seven degrees and certifications. Um, six I got in the United States, one I got in Nigeria. And while I was on my fifth uh, program, my father called me, he's turning 90 years old this year, and said to me, Bennett, why are you getting all this education? What is it for? I said, well, I don't know. He said, no, no, don't tell me that I don't know that no matter what you do, if the education you are acquiring is to serve your own self, to be narcissistic, then it, it shall be null and void. It's, it will be of no benefit. That if that is my motive, I should better stop and go get Mandrill Waters. I said that to Chris Benoit. There's no question in my mind. They are fighting the battle. I mean, nobody from Nigeria. I did not know what the NFL was. I was naive. But when Mike Webster's brain came back, was positive for what I thought it was. I, luckily, again, like my father said to me, I had an MBA, Master's in Business Administration, from Carnegie Mellon University, one of the top 10 business schools in the world. And so I knew business. I knew how to manage a brand. And I said to myself, Bennett, you cannot just publish this as another disease. It will be drowned. You need to give it a name. I need to give it a sexy name. You need to give it a name that has a good acronym that people would remember. Even the three-year-old kid would remember. That was how CTE came about. Why CTE? If you review, I have evidence. I have published papers since the 18th century. People have been talking about reporting doctors that in any activity in life, 
where you expose your head to repeated blows, no matter how seemingly innocuous those blows are, with time you will develop brain damage. And they had all types of names for them. And I would have shown you if the PowerPoint was up. Some of the names were compensation neuroses. Because at some point they thought those people pretended or faked to be sick. Some called it traumatic encephalitis. Some called it concussion neurosis. And some called it chronic traumatic brain injury. Some called it traumatic encephalopathy. So I sat, I sat in my bedroom one night in late 2002. I said, okay, look, there's a possibility that some smart doctor paid very well, more knowledgeable than I am, may disprove me. So I need to give myself a backup. So I needed a name that was generic. So if I'm boxed into a corner, I could wriggle myself out and say, oh, chronic means long term, traumatic means trauma, encephalopathy means bad brain. So chronic traumatic encephalopathy really means bad brain from trauma over time. Doesn't really mean anything. So I had to play both sides. You need to be smart in business. So now I divide the and raise my kids. But he said, however, if you're raising your kid, if, if, sorry, if, if you're acquiring this education to make a difference in the lives of other people, that he would fully support me and go ahead, boy, get all the education you want. That you must aspire to use your God-given talent, the drive to go to school, to acquire knowledge, to help other people around you, to enhance the lives of other people. Because not everybody has the talent to go to school, to acquire knowledge. And after I spoke with him on the phone, it took me quite a while to have a grasp, a mental grasp of what he was saying. So it was in 2001, I was under training as a fellow in forensic pathology under Dr. Cyril Wett. And some lawyers came to him to help him out with a case of a man called Thomas Kimball who was sentenced to death for a quadruple homicide. Dr. Cyril Work reviewed the case, a very big case, not so high profile because Thomas Kimball was some country man up in northern Pennsylvania. So he passed the case over to me. He said, Bennett, see what you can do to help these people out. And I took up the case. A man who had been sentenced to death, he was on death row. And I spent six months on the case. And out of over 10,000 documents, over 2,000 pictures, there was only one picture that showed the hands of a man with blood on it. And I picked up that picture and said, whose hands are this? Are these Thomas Kimball's hands? I said, no, it's the hands of the husband of the victim. To cut the whole story short, I testified on the case. Thomas Kimball was exonerated. The, the, the chief justices of the state of Pennsylvania dismissed the case. And Thomas Kimball was set free from death row. So that was my very first experience of using my knowledge to make a difference in the lives of others. And he's still alive today, Thomas Kimball. He was mildly mentally retarded. That was why he was vulnerable. So in 2002, 